Thessalonians chapter 5, a couple of weeks ago we studied verses um, 6 through 8. Tonight we will start with verse 9. So, kind of a quick summary. The time before last, we talked about that the coming of Christ, the beginning of that day of the Lord is it's going to happen very suddenly, not predictable. And so we need to be ready and that the Lord is coming. And so we talked about his coming and that it, it can happen basically in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Last time we talked about, yes, he's coming, but what attitude should we have as we are living as he is coming? And that's verses 6 through 8. So I'll go to, through them extremely quickly, and then we'll talk about our verse for tonight. We'll start from verse 9. So verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Basically, we saw that there's two definitions of sleep. One definition was found uh, in the last section of chapter 4 from 13 onward, and that means death for a believer. But we saw that there's another word for sleep, and that is in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. And in there, the definition is the, the, the believer who is uh, sleeping spiritually. They are kind of morally indifferent. They are not on fire for God. They're just kind of going through the motions. And so he says, listen, we, we should not live that kind of life. Therefore, because Jesus is coming, that should motivate us, and we should not live a life of being morally indifferent, of being sleeping spiritually, not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. And we talked about watching and sober and what the difference that is. Basically, let's be alert. Let's have the right mind and the right attitude to serve God. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. And basically, he's, he's comparing believers and unbelievers. He says, this is the life of unbelievers that are morally indifferent, that are drunk with this world, that are not really aware of anything that's happening. That's for them. That's not for us. And that's why he says those, not us. But let us, now he talks to believers, he flips to believers when he says us, let us who are of the day be sober. We are the ones that are belong to the light, sunlight, the day meaning the morning. Be, be sober and then he says we should put on the breastplate of faith and love. We really need these two things, and these two things protect our heart, and that's faith and love, uh, protect our heart against Satan messing uh, with our emotions, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. And these are really the two essentials we need to always protect from Satan, our mind and our heart. And then when it comes to, to our mind, when Satan messes with us, oh, come on, everything is the same. He's not coming. He says, listen, you need to have that hope of salvation. He is coming. You know he's coming. It is an absolute uh, reality. It is just a matter of his timing and the hope of salvation. And so we just talked about, you know, the, the, those are the three important things. And we even compared it to a few verses in the Word of God. But one of the most famous ones in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is that chapter of love, the way it ends, it says, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And so here we see basically if you want the bare minimum to face life as a believer that is waiting for the Lord, you need faith, hope, and love. And then we see them here in, this, uh, uh, in, this, in the breastplate, we see faith and love. And in the, in the helmet, we see the hope of salvation, and that's hope. So tonight, we'll start with verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here he says, listen, here's now knowing that, yes, there is a rapture that's going to happen. And once that rapture happens, it's going to set us into the events that happen after that, which is called the day of the Lord and the seasons and the times. It has to do with things that are specifically going to happen relating to the nation of Israel. So it's going to set us into that time frame. He says, uh, God did not appoint us to wrath. Yes, there's rapture, but that's going to be a cutoff. There's something going to happen on that day of the rapture or that moment of the rapture, and it's going to be cut off to set the time for what, it, what, is, what comes after that. And so here he says, for God did not appoint us to wrath. Listen, believers, I want you to be at ease. I want you to not be afraid. I want you actually to be excited about the rapture. 
that Jesus is coming. Because when in the rapture comes, he guarantees us something that God did not appoint us to wrath. And the wrath is the day of the Lord. We said the day of the Lord. If you guys remember, this is a few weeks ago. Hopefully we can remember, but let me just examine and see. The day of the Lord, what does it mean? What was the definition of that? Judgment day. So it's God judging sin and having victory over it. That's the day of the Lord. And that can happen in, in, to believers and unbelievers in a general or a sense that it can happen to us when we are sinning and God wants to get us right. So he comes and he deals with sin in our lives. But then there's like a specific term when it talks about end times. The day of the Lord is talking about God's wrath during the time of the tribulation, which is going to be seven years. And then after that comes the millennial reign and then eternity afterward. And so here, for God did not appoint us to wrath. So here we are just talking about what the time from verse 1 to verse 8. We're talking about rapture. We're talking about the day of the Lord, the events after the rapture. He says, listen, you don't have to be afraid of will I be left behind? Will I be here for the wrath? Will I be here for the tribulation? Will I be here during the time of the tribulation? He says, you have not been appointed for that. You have not been appointed for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God said, listen, yes, throughout your life, you go through many trials and many tribulations. That's part of our package as believers. But there's one thing that is not part of our package, and that is the wrath to come at the time of the tribulation, because that is like the worst wrath that could ever happen to anybody. He says, that one I'm, I'm going to spare you guys. That is not for you. You have not been appointed for that. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people interpret this. They're saying, no, what this really says is God did not appoint us to wrath, like eternal condemnation, hell. And, but he has done this, but, he, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we take just this verse by itself, it would make sense, right? I'm not, and it is a true statement, what, what is being said. I am not appointed to go to hell as a believer because of the work that he has done. He has saved me on the cross. But it then, you know, it's really important to take the verse in the context. The context here is talking about tribulation time. So if he says there's tribulation time and the beginning of it and that, that, that day of the Lord and the rapture that sets it off, and then he says it not appoint us to wrath, it makes much more sense. It, it is illogical to, to include it on a general sense. It makes much more sense that we apply it to the time of the tribulation, that that's what's happening, that he's going he's gonna to take us, uh, he's going to save us from that. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to save us from that day. Because he did not appoint us for that day because we, it is hard to handle that time of tribulation. Now, to back this up, and if we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So here we're saying that, listen, here's how our life should look like. To wait... For his son. So we're not just waiting aimlessly for nothing. We are waiting for something very specific, and that is not really something, but someone for his son, the son of God the Father. And then he tells us not only are we waiting for someone specifically, but we're also waiting for someone who's coming from a specific location from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. By the way, he, had, he's, he can keep his promise because he is powerful. He was able to, to live after he died, he was raised from the dead. And then he defines him, he says, not just some ambiguous son or God or goddess or whatever. No, he says, even Jesus. And then he says, he is going to, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Because when he comes to take us, he's the one that's coming with the rapture. He says he's going to come with the clouds, right? He's going to come and he's going to deliver us from that wrath to come, which is talking about the tribulation that's going to follow the rapture in this time. So... Now, I know that there's others that believe that there will be, we will be here during the time of the tribulation. That's okay. I respect their viewpoint. I don't agree with it. And I don't think the Word of God supports what they say. But the Lord Jesus loves you. And it's not, you know, there's no need to debate too much about it, you know, because it won't matter. 
Because when the Lord comes, we're going to find out who's right. And will it matter? It won't matter in the big scheme of things. It's not a matter of salvation and lack of salvation. But my opinion, based on what I'm seeing here in the Word of God, is that we are not going to be here during the time of the tribulation. And this shows the amazing love of Jesus Christ that he says, hey, you're mine, and I want to take you with me. We could spend a lot of time to prove the point, but I would rather not take too much time on a non-essential point. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he talks about Jesus, he says, who died for us. He says, listen, Jesus paid a price. He paid an amazing price, and that he said he didn't just die, but he died for a purpose. He died for us. He died to save us. But who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So, wake is easy, right? We understand wake? Yeah? Giselle's laughing at me. Wake. You're awake. You are alive. How about sleep? What does sleep mean in the Word of God? Okay, one being dead or physically, actually physically being asleep, or did you want to redefine that a little bit? Well, like, how about acting out? Well, no, what if they're snoring that comes with it? So we'll say spiritually being asleep, okay? So s some will say that the meaning here means alive or dead. So let me read it that way. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, so at the time of his coming, at the time of the rapture, whether I am alive or whether I am dead, sleep, we should live together with him. We're going to have eternal life to spend it with him. Now, that is, uh, and I know why people say that, because they're afraid of the state of the church if they say something different. Uh, I don't fully agree with it. Here's why. So sleep, the definition of sleep equals death is found in, in chapter 4. But the definition of sleep equals morally asleep or morally different or spiritually asleep is found in chapter 5. And this verse is talking about the same thing. It's, it's just a few verses in the same section that's talking about the rapture and the tribulation that's going to come after the rapture. So here's what I believe it, it, it is saying. Who died for us, that whether we are awake spiritually, we're on fire, or sleep, we are, we are not on fire for God. We are morally indifferent. We are spiritually numb. Whether we are, it doesn't matter what our state is, that we, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. What does this mean? Why do I believe this? Why, do, well, why is it dangerous? Because people will be like, well, I don't care. Right? If the Lord comes right now and I'm really on fire for him, great. If I'm not on fire for him, nothing, that's not going to matter. I'm still going to heaven. But the thing is, in the section, it's talking about sleep equals morally indifferent, morally asleep, not on fire for God, just a few verses before that. So um, if, if, we, if we say that the flow goes better like that, this shows us the amazing, the amazing heart of Christ. Why? Because we see in the verse that we just finished, verse 9, we see the heart of Christ. He says, listen, I'm not going to allow you to go through this kind of trial. It's too much. I'm not going to allow you to go through this Time of tribulation. Okay, I just will not allow it. I'm going to take you with me because you are so dear to me and you are so important to me. So that one shows the magnificence of our God. This verse also shows the amazing magnificence of God and something that we struggle a lot with, and that is that salvation is by grace, through faith. It's not works. It's not a works-based salvation. And so here he says, listen, the reason you are going to heaven has nothing to do with you. The reason you are going to heaven is because he died for you. Because you have been saved by grace through faith. And that's why he starts that verse, who died for us. It's all about him. 
It's about how amazing He is. It's about that price that He paid for us, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, so it's not like, okay, what did I just, because people, some people are really afraid, okay? They believe like, I, 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 they're paranoid, and they walk with God, and they say, you know, well, I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? Well, I'm afraid, well, what if I sin like right before I die? I've lived a really like, lived all for Him for all my life, and then just that moment I messed up, and boom, I died. What's going to happen to me? And they're afraid. They're paranoid. He says, you don't have to be paranoid. You don't have to be afraid because you don't make it to heaven on what you do or don't do. You're in heaven because you have been chosen. You're in heaven because of grace, because of Him, because of His work, because of what He has done for you. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, doesn't matter my exact state at the time of the rapture, how awesome and on fire I am for Him, or how I'm not on fire for Him. I'm talking about true believers here. We should live together with Him. All of us are going to make it if we're believers. Not if we're church attenders. If we're believers, true believers, we're going to make it to heaven and be with Him. We're all going to escape the wrath to come, the tribulation. We're all going to be with Him in heaven at the time of the rapture. You know, it's kind of like this. Think of it this way. And this, you know, some people would say, well, this is a dangerous theology because this can make people, you know, not care and be asleep. But actually, look at it this way. Imagine you are reaching for something that is impossible. You, that, is, that in itself, you could try for a while. You get kind of pumped up. You say, okay, I think I could do this. I think I could do this challenge. And then after a while, you're like, you know what? I don't think so. I'm not going to do this. This is, this is unreachable. But imagine someone hands you on a platter that which is impossible, and then he, he gives it to you, and then he says, hey, now how about, you've, you didn't deserve this. You've, you've, gi- you've been given this thing that you have not earned, you didn't deserve. How about now you give me your all? How about now you live for me? You feel like, well, okay, I'm at ease because I'm in. I'm in. Now I can live for him. I'm not afraid will I be in. I'm not terrified will I be in. Is he going to accept me? Is he? he says, no, no, no. Your position in me is perfection. But how about now let, let, let's let your practice, your life, your walk be equivalent to how I see you. Let's let it match up in the way that you live for me. And because you're in, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about make, being accepted. You are in. You are in with me, now live. And that's why the verse right after that, he says, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. He says, listen, believers, you are going, I have some good news for you. You're going to heaven. And you're going to heaven before the tribulation. But not just that. You're going to heaven Because of the work that Jesus Christ has done for you. Because He loved you so much that He died for you. And it doesn't matter how on fire or not so on fire you are for Him. You are going to heaven. So now be at ease. Now I want you to give me your ears. And believers, I need you to step up. I need you to step up and stop being those who sit in the pews. Stop being those who just come and attend and that's it. I need you to be a blessing to each other. And that's why he says here, therefore, comfort each other. It doesn't say that let the pastors comfort you or let the preachers comfort you. No, you need to get out of your zone and do something for someone else. And I want you to actually do two specific things for people. For other believers. This is not for sinners. This is not reaching the lost world. He says, now I want you to focus. That Never lose focus of that. But I want you to focus also on believers. To focus on believers. And focus on comforting one another. Therefore, comfort each other is the number one. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to edify one another. Then he tells the Thessalonians, you guys are already ahead of the game. Just as you also are doing. 
So my first question, are you and I doing this already or not? Are we a comfort to other believers or not? Do we edify other believers or not? Like, do I come to church, and I, I'm going to touch on this again a little later. Why do I come to church? You know, some, um, sometimes people are like, you know, why do you go to church? Do you get something out of it? Wrong. It's actually what do you contribute at your church? That's the heart of God about the real reason to attend church. I'm going to share with you another piece of scripture that talks about that. But this one in itself talks about it. It says, comfort each other and edify one another. But here's talking about in life in general. But I'm going to take a specific one about attending church and what we should, how we should be contributing to each other. Do you comfort others or not? Do you edify others or not? If not, you know, we are not at the state of the Thessalonians because he can't say just as you do, just as you also are doing. But if not, we could start it right now, today. What is comfort? What is edify? So very simple. Comfort is to encourage, to lift up, you know. That's comforting. So it's not about a pillow or, you know, giving someone some pain meds. No, that's not comfort. Comfort means to be an encouragement to someone. To edify meaning to build someone up, that you're a blessing in someone's life, that because of you being present in their life, when they look back, they said, wow, I have grown in Christ. I look more like Jesus Christ than I did before. What is that? How do I, how do I comfort people? How do I edify people? Well, it's actually quite a simple formula. You see, if you take, you know, outside materials, Things that are, you know, lectures from things outside. Yeah, no. Use the Word of God. Use the Word of God to build up each other. Use the Word of God to, to, to make each other grow and also encourage each other. The Word of God is amazing and it's powerful. Use the Word of God, but don't just use the Word of God. Use the Word of God and live the Word of God. Because the thing is, you know, we could you know, say a lot of nice things in the Word of God, but when we don't live it, that's not effective. It's not real. It's not sincere. We need to live the Word of God, share the Word of God, and then we can comfort. That is truly going to be comforting to others. And it's going to be also um, edifying to others. You know, one, one thing, as I was just saying this right now, a thing came to my mind. So Paul, he, uh, he went to this one place, and uh, so they, they uh, started sharing over there, and then those people, it was Paul and Barnabas, and they're like, whoa, these guys are awesome. You know what? The gods have come down here, and they're, so, you know Paul and, and, and Barnabas are not really sure what's happening. And then these people start coming. And, you know, they're like starting to put up an altar and lighting up, you know, and, you know, doing, like, what's going on? And they're about to do a ceremony and worship. They, they figured it out after a while, you know. You don't, you, you know, it's, you see these ceremonies, you're like, what's going on? Especially if you're going to a culture that you don't know. You know, like there's certain cultures, if they light up things, you know, if you go to certain countries, I don't know if this, you know, cannibalist, like, you know, you might be the one that's going to go on the thing, you know, and <laughs> we were just in Sacramento, and we went to this one place. Oh, I, they had this, they were roasting a pig. They had, uh, it was, huh? What's it called? Huh? Spin? Spit? Spit. Hmm, that's a cool name. So, yeah, they had the spit inside the, in, through the hole. You see, it was. So, anyways, yeah, I took a picture of my daughter with that thing and her friend. So, they were doing, you know, 
they had that looks. So some t- people can have a ceremony. You could be the spit can go through you, and then you're going to be eaten. So, but they, they, they weren't going to eat them. They were going to worship them. So they go over there, and they, they do that. And then they realize, wait a minute. These guys are not like doing something normal. We're not going to eat a meal here. They're going to worship us. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop, stop, stop. And they're insisting, no, I have to worship you, my God, or you came from heaven, you know. And, and they, with effort, it says, they made them stop. So, we're good. Well, then these other people who hated them came down and convinced those same people who just were about to worship them the next day or very shortly after to stone them to death. Can you imagine people coming to worship? you be like, oh, you should, I should have let them worship me the other day. I could have bossed them around all I wanted, you know, protecting myself. But now they went, and they went with rocks at Paul. Boom, 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 boom. He's dead. They drag him, pull him outside the city. And they're like, yep, he's not breathing. They take off. Disciples come, go around Paul, and he, he's alive. So can you imagine what he looks like at this time? Pretty beat up, right? You know, imagine rocks went on you enough to kill you. That's a lot of rocks. So not only are you beat up, not only are you sore, but there's, what? there's wounds everywhere. So right after this, he leaves. He's like, okay, maybe it's not, I'm not welcome here. <laughs> Let's go to the next city. So he goes to the next city, and then in that next city, he says something to them. He says that guys, by many stripes... We must enter the kingdom of heaven. So here he's excited. He's saying it is a blessing. It is a privilege to suffer for Christ's sake. Now who's preaching to you? Paul the apostle. What does he look like? He's got blood from every direction. And he's bruised up. He's got, you know, some purple, some blue, some, some red, all, and some oozing and from all different ages of wounds. And he's saying this with excitement. That looks very different than a guy standing from a pulpit saying, you guys must suffer for Christ. Right? It is really hard. It is rough here in Hawaii. Please suffer for Christ. By the way, after this, let's meet at the pool and drink some smoothies. (laughs) If we want to encourage comfort each other if we want to edify each other we need to share the word but we need to live the word paul shared and lived and it says by his words they were encouraged you you think they'd be discouraged like well i don't want to look like that i don't want to suffer like that but they were encouraged because they said how can he be so excited so on fire for the lord when he's going through that and i see him he's alive in front of me he was dead yesterday And now he's alive and on fire and won't quit and keeps going for the Lord. So guys, we need to be, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. I'm going to share a few things. So, you know, I said a couple couple times ago, we talked about that the Lord is coming. Last time we talked about, guys, we need to have an attitude. We need to live the life as he's coming. But tonight, what's on my heart about his coming is, We need to encourage each other because he's coming. We need to be a blessing to each other because he's coming. Yes, we need to live the life, but we need to extend it beyond just I'm living, I'm surviving, I'm living for him. I need to extend it to where how can I bless other believers in my life, other believers that are in my community, other believers that God has allowed me to be in contact with to be a blessing to them. Therefore, come for each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. And when you're doing it, don't stop. It doesn't stop until... It is time for you to meet the Lord. That's the time when that stops. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he, about Jesus Christ, died for all. Listen, he paid the price for believers and unbelievers. He died for all. That those who live Now, now, unfortunately, not everyone's going to live. Only those who receive him, those who accept the work that he has done for them on the cross. So he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. It's not about them anymore, because he died for them. But for him who died for them and rose again. 
Who do you and I live for? You know, He's done this for you. The question is, what have you done for Him? He saved your life. He took a bullet for you. Actually, He took eternal condemnation from you. He didn't do that just to be like, oh, thank you. No, He says that He has a purpose. That those who live should live no longer for themselves. Has Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was not, you know, he didn't like beat around the bush. He didn't try to trick us. He says, I have an agenda. I have a purpose of why I saved you. I have a purpose of why I died for you. Now, how do I know if I'm living that purpose or not? How do I know if I'm really living for him or not? Well, the real question is, who do I live for? If it's living for me, then I'm not really living for him. I'll tell you guys a really funny story. So we were on the bus. So um, this one lady, I see her going like that with her camera. So it's pointing toward me. And then, but her friend sitting behind me and her friend's daughter sitting behind me. So I'm thinking that they want to take a picture of, you know, she wants to take a picture of her friend. And so I'm trying to be polite. Plus, I hate being in pictures. So I'm going like this. And then she, so she thinks I'm looking at her. And then she keeps like moving it, and I keep moving, and then she keeps moving, and I keep moving. And then she finally stops. She's like, what are you doing? Why are you looking at me? And I'm like, are you talking to me? <laughs> I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? I said, uh, I'm trying to get out of your picture. She's like, I'm not taking a picture of you. I said, I know it's not of me. Why would you take a picture of me? It's of them. She's like, no, no, honey, it's about me. It's all about me. It's a selfie. And I was like, oh. I was doing this for a while. Anyways, we all let her have it the whole time. We made fun of her the whole way. There and back. No longer for themselves. So, obviously, I don't think that lady means it like that, but she was, her statement that I'm using as a joke is, it's all about me. That's what she said. It's all about me. The picture's about me. It's all about me. Who do you live for? Who do you live for? Is it all about me? Is it all about the selfies? Is it all about the, what I need to post? Is it all about being up to date? Is it all about being cool? Is it all about the latest, the finest? The, the, the. then we've missed the point of why he died for us. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. He died for you. Live for him. Live for him. And I pray that we would live this life so that we can be an encouragement to each other, so that we can comfort and edify one another. Hebrews 10. So we'll read 25 first, and then we'll go to 24, and then explain 25. Not forsaking, so meaning not leaving, the assembling of ourselves together, in plain English, it means don't leave or don't stop going to church. That's what that means. The assembling of ourselves together. The word assembling meaning attending church. As is the manner of some, because some people have missed the reason of what it means to go to church. But exhorting one another... And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So before we dive into this verse, let's go to the verse before it. And let us consider one another. So he's talking about church attendance. Listen, as I'm going to church, let's get my head on right. Okay, this is not life. This is church attendance. And let us consider one another. As I'm going to church, I'm thinking of other people that are there. Let us consider one another in order 
And now here's my purpose why I'm going to church, okay? To stir up love and good works. So not to stir up people, okay? Not to cause division. Did you see what he said? Are you, you know? That is not why we go to church. People who go to church and do that, they're going to be under a very difficult program from God. But no, here's why you go to church. And let us consider one another. It's about, it is not about, what am I going to receive? It is not about who I'm going to hear. It is about how can I contribute? And there's specific contributions that God wants out of us in church. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love. My presence in the church, if I do it right, is so important that I should be a catalyst of love. I should stir up love in people. So if I find myself doing this thing that I call it everything else but what it is, which is gossip, I'm not stirring up love, I'm stirring up people. I am not doing what I'm supposed to be doing in church. But I'm supposed to be a catalyst of love. I'm supposed to stir up love. I'm supposed to, to, to be a person that when I'm at church, when I am at church, people fall more in love with God and with each other. That's my purpose. It's not to be like, oh, I, you, know, you know, this is... It's about love, but not just love. And good works. I should be a catalyst, again, to stir people up to doing good works. And be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I think you should do this, and you should do that. No. I should be like, well, wait a minute. If this is something that God has put on my heart, something that I'm able to do, I'm the first to volunteer. And then guess what? People start getting stirred up. Like, well, wait a minute. He's doing this. Let me do it. She's doing this. Let me do it. You know what's amazing? The Moses, when it came time, they want to build the tabernacle, right? You guys know what, what goes into the tabernacle? Is there like something that's expensive that goes in there? Like some material that's expensive? Does anyone know what it is? Or there's nothing. It's all cheap stuff. What do you think? Huh? Gold. Yeah. Is gold expensive or cheap? Expensive. Okay. So, you know, where is Moses going to come up with the money? Did he have a savings account? He's broke. Where does he come get money from? I mean, how do we know he's broke? No, man, he was the prince of Egypt. Yes, he was. And then he ran away. He's got nothing. He, when he ran away, it didn't, it's not like he's like, oh, let me go pack my bags. He was like, oh, they know. And he's out of there because he wants nobody to see him. So he was just with the clothes on him. That's all he's got. And then even if he had something after 40 years, that's been spent, you know. No matter how much you know how to save, you can't save whatever you've got for 40 years. Where does he get the money from? From the people. How do you get the money from the people? He didn't tax them. He didn't force them. He said, guys, we want to worship the Lord. We want to build the tabernacle of the Lord. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart, come. Do you guys know what happened? People gave and then gave. The next person saw the person giving, so they gave, and then 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 they, gave, and then they keep counting, and then they keep counting. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. okay, wait, we need this much budget. Okay, now we've exceeded the budget. Oh, we're, we keep exceeding. They're like, stop giving. Stop giving. Stop it. You see, that's called stirring up good works, stirring up love. You know, I, I, I really like dislike some of the programs when people need stuff. Man, it's like this begging thing that happens. No, if it's done right, it's, you should do, first of all, the work of the Lord should be what is being on the table. Not what someone wants or some vision or some dream that someone has. Who cares about your dream or my dream? Does the Lord want this? It's going to happen. Now you want to see it happen in a magnificent way? Stop trying to plan too much. Let him guide you and look at the people of God and see how this thing comes to play. You know, it's really amazing 
when we trust the Lord. But it's also really amazing how we can, when we trust the Lord and we live that genuine life, we start stirring each other up, and then everyone starts to be a blessing to one another. It becomes a good catalyst rather than we're a, you know, a downer to people spiritually. So here he says, listen, if you go to church, I want you to go to church differently now. I want you to not go to church because, hmm, oh, he's preaching, I'm going. He's preaching, I'm not going. She's singing, I'm going. She's singing, I'm not going. They're leading worship, I'm going. They're le- Stop it. Go to meet the Lord, you will hear him. I can guarantee you. As long as it's a true Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Doesn't matter what title they have. Just be where you, God wants you to be. But then don't just go to sit in the pew. Go and be a blessing. Go and stir love. Go and stir good works. And let us consider one another. It's about each other, guys. One another in order to stir up love and good works. So if you say this is just love for God, I would say it's actually, if you had to exclude one, it would be love for God. Because one another, okay? But it includes both. Not just that, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Don't do it. Don't be one of those who skips church, who chooses when to go to which meeting, depending on who is doing what. You've missed the mark. You've messed up. You're worthless in church. You've lost your reason of why you're there. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as is the manner of some, because this has become a fashionable thing. I go to hear him, I go to hear her. I don't go to hear him, I don't go to hear her. You're going for the wrong reason. You're supposed to go to be a blessing to others. But exhorting one another. Again, it's not about the speaker. It's not about what happens on the pulpit. It's about what are you contributing? Exhorting, meaning encouraging one another. Are you going to be an encouragement or not? Do you plan to come here and just sit and listen in the pew? Or do you plan to come and bless somebody? But exhorting one another, and so much the more. Now, if church attendance becomes really, really important, and like, you know, skipping church should be like a really big deal, and a really, really, I should have a really, really good reason for it, Here's when, when this becomes even more important to attend church. And it's not attending church because you can get some check mark or you have some numbers. No, no. It's about because you have a huge contribution among God's people. Here's when it becomes really important. And so much the more. So it's not more. No, so much the more. Those are all, you know, augmenting words, right? So, so is big. The I mean, so is big, much is even bigger, right? Because it's now not so, it's so much. And the, that's even bigger, more, as you see the day, capital D, approaching. You know what the day is? The rapture. So as the end times comes, you're going to see some people make it fashionable to skip church. They think it's optional. It's all surveys, you know? Here's what I like, here's what I don't like. No, 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 don't fall into the whole survey thing of the culture. You're going there to meet the Lord. So if the day is coming, the day is approaching, the rapture is coming, the signs look like we are in the end times, this is so much the more to attend church. But not attend church to be in the pews, because you're just using up space. Believers, Come, consider one another. Stir one another in love and good works. But also exhort one another. I really pray we get it. Because I tell you, based on our life and my observation, we don't get it. It is really important Because it means you are ready for his coming. 
and you are a blessing to people as the day is approaching. Please wake up, believers. It's not optional. You are much more important than you think. You are so useful to Him than you think. Don't fall into the trap of Satan, of belittling you, saying, what good is that? What good is what you've got? Don't fall into that trap. I was reading the other day on, on the way, actually, on this trip. I was reading in John chapter 6. And, and God just really spoke to me that, that morning about that when Jesus was saying, you know, well, how are we going to feed these people? 5,000 men, not counting the women and the kids. So one of the disciples says, I mean, we've got, he's like, show me what you've got. So one of the disciples said, I mean, we've got five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish, but what is that for this? What is that? What is that for this group of people? It's nothing. It's little. He says, bring it to me. Bring me the little that you've got. I want to show you how much that is worth. And that just blew me away how many times we approach God that way. Like, Lord, what do I have to offer? Like, what can I really share? How can I really be contributing? I mean, really, I don't know enough in your word. I, you've fallen into his trap, Satan's trap. Because he says, oh, that's little. Well, I mean, it's really a joke. I mean, if you give me five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish, I'll be like, okay, that's a one-man meal, right? You're not, I'm not going to share that. Huh? It's barely enough for me. So you take enough for a grown man. And he made it enough for more than 15,000 people. If you imagine for every man there's a woman, for, for every one of them there's one baby. And in those days they had lots. So it's really way an underestimation, a very conservative estimation. But it wasn't enough. It was abundant. He says the part, so that blew me away, that part. I just kept pausing there. And, you know, this was five in the morning, okay, that we were on that bus. Woke up from four o'clock. I'm really tired, but just the Lord just took grab of me with that. And then as I kept reading the next verses, and then it says that he said, Jesus told him, he says, listen, I want you to collect the crumbs, that none would be lost. And that just overwhelmed me. None would be lost because, you see, that which was thought to be a joke to serve, to bless these people, turned out not to just barely satisfy them. They were full. And like, do you want seconds? Do you want thirds? Like, no, I, don't care. I can't handle anymore. And then there was on top of that, there was extra, that they had bags and bags and bags of extra. And he says, collect it all, even the crumbs, that nothing is lost. No blessing when you pour yourself out for the Lord with the little that you have and you allow Him and you give it to Him. He doesn't want any of it to go away, any of it to go away. He says, I don't waste that stuff. Because what you've got is little, but in my hands, oh. Believers, hope you don't take me the wrong way. I don't mean this in a legalist way, but do not skip church. It better be a really good reason. When you go to church, stop going to just listen. But please listen when you go. But that's not the only purpose. Please consider one another. Be looking out for others around you. Stir up love and good works. Exhort one another. I don't like to talk about myself, but just it applies to this. So when I went on this Sacramento trip, I went there, and first thing that came in my mind, I was like, oh, this is awesome. I get to be with my oldest daughter. I am finally not in charge of anything. I can shut down, relax, enjoy her, 
and have these wonderful three days together. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And when I got on that bus, again at five in the morning, as I was praying before I read the word of God, I felt this weird thing inside me and I started praying differently. Because I was thinking like, I mean, this is a Christian school and these are really awesome Christian people. And I said, well, I mean, listen, I'm here to be with my daughter. What can I contribute? There's nothing. I'm just here to attend, to enjoy. And I just felt, I started praying this prayer and I couldn't be quiet. So I started poking at the kids, started asking them Bible questions, talking to the parents and to the leaders and sharing with them the word of God. And it was, it was really an awesome. And we started encouraging each other and sharing from, with each other the word of God. Don't go to attend. Don't go to attend. Go to contribute. Please. Stop coming to attend. Stop coming to be like, check. Came. Come. Make a difference. You don't have to be on a pulpit. I wasn't on no pulpit. But I can tell you, there's some people there that were a blessing to me. And I know I was a blessing to some people there. First John 3, I'm going to go really fast. Verse 28, and, uh, chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him. Stay strong. Hold on to him. That when he appears, meaning the rapture, we have confidence. We need to live that life of cont contribution. We need to live that life of, of stirring one another. We need to live that life of helping each other. We need to live a life of encouraging each other. That when he, we have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming, stop this attitude of, I just want to barely make it. Stop it. Yes, whether you're awake or asleep, you're going to make it. But no, that's not the way to go. You want to go there because he is worthy and he deserves it. And he has died for you that you don't live for yourself. Chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. This is, we, is a fact that we know, that we are his children. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Okay? The, the, the full-on eternity is a little mysterious to us. We can't fully say we have some idea of some of the things. But there's some things we know. that We know that when he is revealed, the rapture, the rapture happens... We shall be like him. We're going to look like him. We're not going to be exactly carbon copies of him, but we're going to have glorified bodies. We're going to have our own bodies that we are identified with. So I was talking to one of the, the, the people there, one of the leaders on the bus, and then so, um, and, and the person was telling me, you know, I said, you know, maybe the Lord will come. And this person was like, amen, come Lord. I said, amen, come Lord Jesus. And then the person was like, you know, we get other bodies, right? I was like, yeah, we get glorified bodies. The person's like, I want my 25-year-old body. <laughs> and I said, you can get one without blemishes. Don't worry. It's going to be awesome. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. The coming of Jesus should make me encouraged that I have this hope that he is coming, that this makes me purify myself. It doesn't say just as he purifies himself. He, never, he was always pure. Just as he is pure. I should live my life wanting to look like Jesus Christ every day, looking close to him. And every day I'm a blessing to someone around me, and someone around me is a blessing to me. I was going to share one more scripture, but we need to stop. So back to our verses, and we're going to end. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to be here in the time of the tribulation. He's going to take us with the rapture. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we are saved by grace. We're, we're guaranteed heaven. Okay, It doesn't matter how on fire or not on fire we are. We should live together with, with him. We're going to live with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another. Because I know he's coming. And I know he's so loving that it's his grace that saves me. It's not my works. So that pressure is off. And because I know he's going to save me from that, from that day to come, from that uh, uh, tribulation, therefore comfort each other and edify one another. Be a blessing to each other. Stop living life for you 
or for your own edification, for your own comfort. Start thinking of others, comfort other, comfort each other, and edify one another just as you also are doing. I hope the Lord spoke to you about something tonight. Let me pray that we just spend a couple minutes before him. And if anyone wants to pray out loud, maybe, maybe it's, maybe what God spoke to you about is to not be afraid of him, but to fear him. There's a big difference between the two. One is, a, is an attitude of terror. The other is an attitude of love and reverence for him. That he saved you and he's taking you to heaven and he's going to make you escape that tribulation. Maybe the issue is that I'm just living for myself. Maybe it's time that we live for one another, we comfort one another, we edify one another, we stir one another in love. We consider one another, we exhort one another. If anyone wants to pray out loud.